Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, just express my delight to be here in South Australia, my third visit. And uh, I want to thank the University of Adelaide, my chief sponsor, in, in bringing me here and internationalizing uh, not only the perspectives of the, the student and faculty community, but uh, the community at large. And that's one of the most impressive elements that I find of Australian society is this close-knit weave from state to state and community to community. So my ability to have a little hop across the pond and and uh, enrich uh, your thinking about a particularly uh, a passion of mine of global health is, is a special delight. I, uh, my affection for your community is not just, not just the diplomatic niceties. I like to cite that uh, last fall, one Sunday, I opened the Sunday New York Times in the travel section and the travel section of the New York Times appeals to a very sophisticated readership. And lo and behold, there was an article that read, 36 hours in Adelaide. Well, I certainly wanted to read this, and you can certainly look it up on Google. And I noticed that what the reporter was so excited about were features on your landscape, your cityscape, that had not existed the last time I was here several years ago. So I think that, I just want to say that's a testimony, test, testimony, testament to your civic planners to create a vibrant and world-class city. And uh, dovetailed with that, I had occasion to see out from the outside your new biomedical research complex with the SAMRI, the, the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, uh, the new medical school and, and research center. And I, I'm very impressed with this because um, it is emblematic of what we need in global health. We, we need major capital investments in, in countries like Australia, states like South Australia. And <clears throat> it is uh, an opportunity uh, for the health, public health forces here to not only, not only to uh, protect and advance the health of Adelaideans and South Australians, but also to advance the health uh, throughout Oceania and the world at large. And this is not just <clears throat> an idealistic uh, ambition. Uh, we have all seen uh, the tragic spread of a disease like Zika. And if you have, uh, and many of you who are in, in epidemiology, uh, trace uh, the flow of Zika. It was first discovered in Uganda back in the, in the 40s, and it had a very uh, zigzaggy uh, uh, progression that uh, ended up flowing through Southeast Asia, French Polynesia, uh, to the, to the uh, islands off South America, and entrenched itself uh, with uh, devastating consequences in Brazil, uh, the Caribbean, and, and now literally on the shores of the United States. Uh, and when I looked at how, where the mosquito vector resides, I, and not knowing much about Australia, I saw that the, the chief vector, the mosquito vector, the Aedes aegypti mosquito, is resident in Queensland. <clears throat> so as I thought about how the flow of this insidious um, uh, pathogen uh, went across the oceans, you're very fortunate that when Zika transited through French Polynesia, didn't take a south turn and come to your shores. Um, so going forward, you know, this investment by your country, your community, in establishing a, a substantial biomedical presence here is, will be strategic, ought to be seen as a national and global asset. Because if we had had what I call a global health emergency force with the authority to enter uh, health crisis zones, uh, we might have had the opportunity to truncate Zika uh, as it tried to go across the Pacific. So I, I, I believe that uh, 
this asset that you're building here, this complex, uh, can be an inspiration for the public health work, the public health forces at the WHO and the, the regional offices in uh, Manila and New Delhi. And I encourage, and I encourage those, the leaders uh, to, to radiate out uh, this, this capability. Um, so the global health landscape is very much a dynamic, dynamic landscape. Uh, in addition to Zika, we saw the devastating impact of Ebola. And again, uh, the surprise attack of this one virus to devastate uh, three hard-hit countries in West Africa uh, was in the States, uh, among the public, was uh, seen at first more as a exotic novelty, a, a disease that happens in faraway lands and under conditions that are exotic and would not happen in a developed country like the United States. But when the trigger came, when the, uh, a patient and nurses were uh, infected in Dallas, it transformed uh, this flashdemic from something rare to something that hits home. And the United States has subsequently been spending more funds to uh, not only deal with the, uh, the scientific elements of a disease like Ebola, but also finding a way to educate the general public about risk, the risk of uh, cer certain uh, diseases like, uh, like Zika, um, at, like, like, like Ebola. Um, so the, as I see it, you know, we have both flashdemics, which are these uh, news intense outbreaks, and we also have, in the general term, broad spectrum epidemics, epidemics that cut across class and, and countries. So it's not only uh, infectious diseases, it's uh, chronic illnesses that originate from changing lifestyles. And again, Australia shares many parallels with the United States in trying to educate the public about uh, healthy living, healthy eating, healthy thinking. Um, so in order to do that, we, we need to uh, think broadly uh, in terms of building effective, efficient health systems. Health systems I think of in, in, in two key dimensions, capacity and ability. So the word capability is my code word for thinking about capacity, which is the instrumentation, organization, the tools and technologies that are available to us. And ability is my code word for thinking about the talent, the teamwork that is involved in residents, in, in people that comprise a public health workforce. And together, the team and the talent and the technology and the tools, we have to con uh, create a confluence to specific tactics, how public health can uh, make inroads, further inroads into society. Uh, in order to do that, uh, it is not just intra-health improvements. It is also cross-sector outreach, connecting public health with the schools, connecting public health uh, with, uh, with employers, connecting public health with labor unions. Because without a cross-sector strategy for health, um, citizens and, and leaders tend to look at health as merely a, what I call a white coat issue. That all they, the implication being, well, if I need to take public health action, well, I, I, have, uh, I have my white coats and I, sh I don't need to make any further political investment. And that would be a fundamental mistake. Um, I have dedicated much of my career 
in advancing health as a soft power issue in the United States. Uh, heretofore, it was seen as a technical issue, but the rise of HIV AIDS in, in Africa, flash demics of Zika in Ebola, we are making progress in the United States of raising the profile of health as a strategic imperative, that it is not just a technical bounded issue, that it involves the productivity of countries, it involves the national security of countries. And with Zika, I would, assu I would assert that it's, uh, uh, there's a threat to cultural security. When, when women of childbearing age now have to think in very different terms about starting a family and protecting themselves in order to, be, uh, 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 to, start, to start a family. Um, so the agenda moving forward for global health, I believe, is, is a very rich one. And we are fortunate to have uh, leading lights in the public health community here in Adelaide that can um, elaborate in full detail about these issues. Uh, Patty Phillips is the what I call the uh, public health quarterback uh, in American terms, calling, calling, calling the plays. And we need more Patty Phillips throughout, throughout the world. And I see great need for uh, public health leaders who are not only scientific specialists, but who are economists, who come from the military, who come from business, because then we can have a very uh, tight weave that we see health as integral rather than a white coat issue in society. Um, no talk about advancing global health is complete without discussing the imperative to fight poverty. In the world today, we have seven billion fellow citizens. The World Bank estimates that out of the seven billion, two billion people live on a, an income of less than $3 a day. So 30% of the world is living at $3 a day or $1,000 a year. The implications of which for health and education and every other civic value is quite plain that uh, people, many swaths of people cannot afford basic life-saving medicine. Uh, mortality, morbidity rates are very uh, sky high in Africa and they have in, in turn a security Im implication. So the challenge, the promise, the premise of global health is nested with our drive to fight poverty. And even in countries like the United States and Australia, we have to fight uh, the forces of poverty. Uh, the rise of multi-drug uh, TB resistance is, is clearly a threat. The disparities between rich and poor is also a threat. So the global health agenda is, is not just an offshore agenda. It really begins at home. And the lessons we learned from Australia in fighting its own pockets of poverty and inequality can be the new thread which weaves with what we learned in the United States on fighting poverty. And together, that, that fabric, that, that, that proactive humanitarian strategy of defeating poverty in Africa and Asia will lift all communities. So I, in closing, I'm fond, uh, it is my, it's in the deep within my fabric uh, of, of my professionalism to say that uh, uh, global campaign, the global health campaign is a campaign of liberation because when we suppress disease and advance health, health that all societies are lifted, that children are alive for their, uh, parents are alive for their children and children are alive for their futures and entire nations and societies are alive for their destinies. So that is the premise and the promise of global health. 
Uh, I'm, I'm glad to share my perspectives with you, and I will welcome your questions uh, and, and hope I can answer them thoroughly. So thank you very much.